Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special edition of Writers Drinking Whiskey. I'm going to call Writers on Zoom Drinking Coffee. Uh, don't sue me, Mr. Seinfeld. It's a, it's a one-time thing, I assure you, sir. Um, I am your barista for the day, William R. Hensey, and I am honored and thrilled to have best-selling writer and legendary thriller writer Stephen Hunter with me. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Bill. Good to be here. Yeah, thank you. It's awesome to have you. So I'll give the the brief bio for everyone that's you know tuning in and maybe isn't as uh, familiar as they should be. Um, and I'll, I'll include they, they your should pool. be very familiar. If they're not, get after them. <laughs> I will be sending strongly worded letters to those oh, people good. that aren't. Well, that's a start. <laughs> um, but so you've written over twenty novels. Um, most, like I mentioned, you're best-selling writers, so lots of those have done that. Um, your novel, Point of Impact, became the movie Shooter with uh, Mark Wahlberg. Um, you've written three nonfiction books, um, one of which was American Gunfight, which examines the Harry S. Truman attempted assassination. Um, and you were the chief critic for the Washington Post, um, and you won the 2003 Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished Criticism um, along there. And then you also served in the U.S. Army um, I had it in my notes, actually. We'll see. Maybe I'm going to butcher this because we talked pregame here, but I had it listed as the old guard. Yes, that's oh, fine. Perfect. OK, so yeah, the old guard, which was start, operational yeah. and uh, ceremonial missions, including uh, guarding the tomb of the unknown soldier. I did not do that, but I was familiar with and uh, visited and uh, it was part of the operations of our battalion. <laughs> awesome. Very good. Um, and then the newest book, uh, which we'll get to today, too, is uh, Front Sight, Three Swagger Novels. Um, and that's out as of when this will certainly when this it's out as of now. Correct. Correct. It's out available for everyone. I'll include a link. And that covers the generations of the Swagger family from Grandfather Charles, Father Earl, and then the iconic Bob Lee you know, Swagger. Um, and we'll delve into all those topics today. Was there anything else you'd like to to join on to there or correct me? Uh, you know, <laughs> you're going to discover shortly that I'm not that interesting. So I can't really think of anything else worth, I don't know, high school athletic triumphs. How does that sound? Maybe. No. Uh, did, did you once score three touchdowns in a single game? <laughs> No, nothing, nothing that interesting, no. Sorry. <laughs> Very good. Awesome. And so, and I think I noticed, and maybe this has changed, but are you in the Baltimore area? I do live in Baltimore. I do. You live in Baltimore. Okay. And I worked so, for the Baltimore um, Sun for 26 years before I moved to the Washington Post. And I was the film critic of the Sun for 18 years. Uh, I think it was 18 years. And then I was offered the job in Washington. So I got to change jobs without having to move, which is the best possible combination of consequences <laughs> in adult life, as far as I'm concerned. Right, right. That is that is a winner right there. That's good. Um, awesome. So then you would be great to ask this. So um, in Baltimore, um, and, since, you know, and I wanted to ask it this way, since you are a thriller writer, what is the most thrilling thing that's ever happened in your neck of the woods? Uh, well, uh, maybe it would be the Ravens losing yesterday in pathetic fashion, <laughs> looking sad, beaten, and whipped before the game even began. And the the that you said thrilling, and I I edited out the thrilling and put in depressing. And but what's so depressing about it is they have a history of that. They've they have a tendency to sort of uh, to play very, very, very well until the ultimate moment, in which case they self destruct. And uh, that yesterday was a sad example of that. I I wasn't going to bring it up, but you gave me an opening, and off I went. <laughs> I, I couldn't help myself. It's, it's, I, I was listening to the radio, you know, the call-in sports shows as I was driving sure. somewhere today. It's like Suicide City. Everybody, all these, oh, oh, I don't know, you know, just all this, this angst and wailing tears, and and I mean, it's like it's like 
the city is on the verge of mass suicide or something. We'll get over it. We always do. Uh, but there you uh, go. so I, I won't I won't move my camera here. So it's doing this on its own. I don't know if you. Can oh, see it. there you go. The enemy. <laughs> you know, you guys beat us twice this year. Actually. We and and I must say, I, I really do think Mike Tomlin is a great football coach. And uh, he, what was this, his 18th straight year of finishing over 500? I think it was 18, yeah. Right? yeah. He's yeah. a wonderful football coach. I, 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 I and me, I, I'm not a big Harbaugh fan. And so I do, in fact, envy you, uh, uh, Mike Tomlin, very gifted football coach. Sure, sure. He is. Yeah, well, it was it was a tough year. Our claim to fame this year is at least we beat the Ravens twice, because otherwise yes, it, was, it was. And somehow we always, we either just missed was, the playoffs or we squeak in. That was our in, first but. taste of squalor. Little did we know what lay ahead for us. Very good. So I guess we should move on to happier topics. Okay, so well, that's not not the happiest for either of us. Yeah. This season. Yeah. I mean, it was better for you guys. I remember a time when the Steelers, like we felt like it was our God given right to be in the championship uh, game. You oh, know? you know, I do. It, it, it's a great football city. It really is. Mm-hmm. And that's that's yeah. a, a great football history. It really does. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, and I happen to be one of those guys. I really like Roethlisberger. He was. Oh, uh, sure. He was. I mean, he was. Big and dumb looking, but baby, could he throw that football? He was an artist. Put a football in his hand, and he became Leonardo da Vinci. Sure, sure, yeah. Well, you know what us Steeler fans took to a lot this year? We have uh, this family chat. It's like all my cousins. And and um, I was born in Morgantown, West Virginia, but my family's uh-huh. mostly Western Pennsylvania. In fact, I'm probably going to be flying out there in a few days here. Um, and Canonsburg, which is 20 minutes outside of uh, outside of Pittsburgh. And uh, but we go and then we would just be like, OK, and all of us are just watching old clips of like the the Ravens championship game from 2003 or whatever. And it's, like, it's just like old Big Ben games like, man, yeah. remember when we had that guy? That was those are good yeah. times. Happier times. But yes, um, oh, I thought it'd be fun. So if we started with the film criticism um you know peace and then move into your writing and, and, and dig into all that but what what i uh and oh and i have to say this because besides being the chief you know um film critic at uh washington post you appeared on siskel and ebert which is like yes well uh siskel uh both siskel and ebert were gone by that time uh okay. gene fortunately had died and roger had a uh, some difficulties with his uh I don't know the, the details, but it was difficult for him to talk. And so he had to give up the show. He was still a presence. And in fact, I met him while I was out there and he and his wife and my wife and I, we got together after the show and uh, did some stuff in Chicago. And both my wife and I are from Chicago. So it was initially. So it was, uh, and I had read him for years, even when I was in college and um, uh, I mean, he was always my film critic. And so finally getting to meet him uh, was a real thrill and meeting him as a peer was an also uh, a, a, an awesome thrill. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And as a, as a kid that grew up with Siskel and Ebert, so you, you being on that show to me is like, for one makes you very cool. But it also oh. makes you the authority well, I am cool, on so. everything. Well, yeah, oh. I mean, obviously, <laughs> if you got on there, you know, you're cool yeah. and the authority on all things, you know, film. Yeah. So, and I think anyone my age is going to agree. If you grew up with that, it's like, of course, that's going. If you get two thumbs, like you're golden, you know. That's that's it. That's for sure. <laughs> I used to feel good at night, like I have two thumbs too. You know, it's yeah, like, it's like those guys. Um, I wonder though, because you know, I know you're retired from it now, but um, how has cinema kind of changed over the time from the time you started to now? Uh, well, I, you forced me into one of my least appealing personalities, and that's the bitter old man. Uh, but every film critic believes that he was film critic during a golden age. <coughs> Pardon me. And what came afterwards was an age of dreck and and, and garbage. Uh, I pretty much feel that. I almost never go to modern movies. Uh, I have no sympathy for or interested in computer-generated images 
or superheroes or boys with too much moose in their hair. And I just, <laughs> uh, I just don't find anything compelling me to go to a movie theater to have that experience again. Now, although I used to love that experience. Uh, it, the other aspect of it is of course, there's so much imagery or movie imagery or movie narrative available on the little machine that you and I are talking with and on the big machine over there on the other side of the room that the actual going to the theater experience is really no longer uh, necessary. Uh, So that's one of the things that's changed. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad or indifferent. Uh, As I say, the coming of CGI, in my opinion, was was unfortunate simply because when anything is possible, nothing is interesting. And for me, at least, a movie is still a document of photography. And I, it was just like it was like the net in tennis. It, you couldn't just do effects. You couldn't just decree effects. You had to you had to meet certain very stringent technical challenges. And, uh, you know, that was a, that was a mark of genius. Uh, I think, for example, of the B-52 flight deck in uh, Dr. Strangelove. I mean, that was probably the best movie set in the history of movie sets. It was utterly, totally, completely convincing. And it still is to this day. And, and the whole thing was based on an accidentally published picture of the flight deck of a B-52. Um, and so it's just some art director, I should know his name, but he just built a, a replica of it uh, for the film. And it was a, it was the reality of that set that gave that film its extraordinary impact. Well, you know, now it's just some somebody sitting in a bunker in uh, uh, Beverly Hills at a keyboard and could do the same thing in five minutes. And somehow knowing that vitiates the the uh, impact of 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 what you're seeing. I mean, uh, again, when anything is possible, nothing is impressive. And whereas in 19, uh, I guess it was 64, the flight deck was extremely impressive. No flight deck today. You wouldn't even think twice about seeing it. It It would have no emotional or dramatic impact whatsoever. So that's one way they've changed. Uh, Movies have gotten, uh, you know, you, you know, the litany of complaints. One of course being that, uh, special effects are too important. Uh, drama is less important. Uh, dramatic structure is less important. The one thing that it seems to have lost the movies from movies today is motive. Uh, people just sort of do things arbitrarily and you believe it because you see it because the directors told them to do those things. Whereas the older movies, the movies of my youth and, and uh, young manhood and middle-aged manhood, they were all, uh, as you know, they were, they were variations on, on the novel and on, uh, the play and the, the tissue that held them together was the motives that made people act the way they did. And they were believable to the degree that the motives were consistent and that the behavior made sense in terms of the motive behind it. And again, that seems to be something that at least as far as I can tell is missing from, from movies almost altogether. And uh, I I feel the lack. So I'm much happier watching a movie made uh, 30 years ago or 40 years or last night, for example, I watched The Wild Bunch. Oh, great movie. What a great movie. And uh, I can't, uh, you know, I, I miss that kind of movie. You know, not the gunfight movie, but the movie of 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 emotion and a uh, motive and uh and recognizable believable human character and personality yeah i i wonder um when you say that too because you know i have uh younger kids my son's 13 now he's the youngest of them but we ended up i hadn't watched any of the marvel movies until he was he, yeah. he was very young and he got into it and he, he was like two three and he would sit through them 
And so we could take him and he enjoyed doing it. So, you know, we would take him because that was what he liked to do. Um, but I wonder with that, because now the actors also just have this screen behind them that they're acting in front of. And it's like, how, how do you get into that visceral kind of primal place when like nothing this react to explosion here, react to that? And it yeah, feels I, like everything kind of. I don't know. And it seems like acting has thus become an incredible agglomeration of technical tricks. You know, in other words, a facial control and uh, movement uh, memory and uh, uh, ability to react as if something has happened when nothing is happening. And those are the those are the virtues that are uh, that are uh, that are rewarded. And um, uh, you know. <laughs> It's just different than when you were memorizing lines and you were interpreting the characters and you were expressing that human being through his action, through his appearance, through his through his movement, uh, whatever. And it seems to me, again, it seems to me that it, it's a whole new set of of responsibilities and uh, demands. And uh, while they may be just as demanding as the old acting, it's just something that I'm not sympathetic with and that I don't really understand. I mean, I just uh, hide behind my age here and I'll just uh, <laughs> you know, mutter darkly in the corner. <laughs> Very good. You and I, I wonder, um... And I don't know how well you've, you've kept up with it, but it does seem like there was a time, like I, I immediately said you're the authority on all things because like you're involved with Siskel and Ebert, yeah. right? Was, there was a time where we really trusted our movie critics. And now if you look at like Rotten Tomatoes, you'll it'll be like critic score 80 and audience score 20 or vice versa um, to where. Well, yeah, I think you bring up a very interesting issue. One of the things that was true of the old, and this, what I'm about to deal with has more to do with the internet than the, and that is in the old days, every movie critic was innocent. That is to say, he went and saw the movie. He knew nothing about the movie. He brought his little game to the movie. He wrote his little piece to the best of his ability. And that was the entire transaction. Now he knows up front what every other critic in the country says. So he's also got an issue of dealing with conformism and dealing with pressures to conform, of dealing with not to be thought to be, a, you know, an oddball or someone who doesn't get it. And he is going to, more times than not, he's going to, uh, he's, he's going to yield to the, uh, not, you know, if you feel strongly, he won't. But generally, you know, most movies are between a B minus and a C plus. And that distinction, uh, he is going to, he's going to probably, and not even realize he's doing it, he's going to yield to that. And in my opinion, criticism had much more validity uh, when it was totally independent as opposed to now when it is part of a uh, of a mass market uh, and, and when the the critic the critics used to be unself-aware and now they're exceedingly and this is that what the aggregate sets like sites like uh, rotten tomatoes and uh, others force on them he is he is extremely self-aware and the question is can a self-aware person be an honest person and uh, particularly a critic. And I, I don't know. I don't, uh, I'm not, I'm not crazy about the new criticism. I don't read much of the new criticism. Maybe, you know, I, I used to look to criticism for the excellence of the writing and there were wonderful writers who were film critics uh and their pieces, whether you, it wasn't about whether I agreed with them or disagreed with it. It was, did that movie provoke them to a really interesting piece of English prose? And the quality of the prose was as important to me as the quality of the judgment. And in fact, this is more important to me. I didn't really care about the judgment. And I was 
I, I was proudest of my professional efforts when I felt I had written a good piece uh, as opposed to when I, I had written, oh, I was right about that piece or, oh, gee, I agreed with the New York Times. Chalk one up for me. You know, that's that's the wrong attitude to take. And I don't see the, the quality of writing in film criticism anymore, though it, it's also arguable that uh, there's no... You know, most critics, now, it used to be that if you were a movie critic, you got that job through intense competition. Uh, there were fewer movie critics, I used to always say, than there were movie stars. So it was really harder to become a movie critic than it was to mm -hmm. become a movie star. <laughs> when you sure. got one of those jobs, you clung to it. You wouldn't let it go. It, it was one of the best jobs in Western civilization. And... Um, it, it just was, I mean, to me, it was, it was, it, it was a job I, I would have, I know I would have considered myself a grotesque failure had I not ended up getting that job. And the problem with a job like that is there's no, you know, if you want to be a lawyer, you know what you have to do. You got to go to this school. You have to, you have to apprentice at that firm. You have to pass the law boards. And no one is saying it's easy. And no one is saying you don't have to be quite bright to do it. But it's the steps are known. Whereas we just set out to be something like a movie critic. It's just it's a crapshoot, you know. And it depends on so many factors that aren't in your control. It depends on the way the policy of the newspaper, it depends on the philosophy of the newspaper. Uh, it depends on what value the newspaper puts on critics. And I'm talking as if that newspaper, that kind of newspaper still exists. And in point, it doesn't. Newspapers are much smaller now. They're much more locally interested. They've all become local. They've all become, you know, uh, small local papers. Uh, they don't have foreign bureaus. They don't have feature departments. Everything is shrunken. Uh, and um, so there are very few papers. The Sun, for example, doesn't have a film critic anymore. And they just rely on anodyne. Well, they usually don't run anything. Uh, and it's just, I, I miss the old newspapers, but why wouldn't I? Because I flourished in the old newspapers. Mm -hmm. Sure. The, uh, uh, the public seems, <laughs> you know, seems not to have noticed. I did used to, here's a fun <laughs> thing. I used to say that I believe that movie criticism was one of the seven pillars of civilization. <laughs> but movie criticism fell and civilization is more or less still here. So I, <laughs> I was kind of wrong on that one. No, I mean, yeah. these days, if you have a keyboard, you're a movie critic. That's, you know, sure. you just start a little blog and start shooting your mouth off. And, mm. you know, anybody could get 300 followers. So there you go. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I was wondering about that as you were saying it, because part of it is like you have social media where it's either yeah. you do a video like this, right? So lots of film right. critics just do a video. Yeah. So they, they're not worried about pros. They're just, you know, usually slicing images one on top of each other and kind of talking over it. Yeah. Um, or you get the the Twitter crowd kind of interviewed and it's like 160 characters or something, you know, yeah, I, exactly. I can barely even like I, I literally only do social media for this show. So I post the show and I'll post little clips, you know, uh, yeah. I take about 20 minutes a day. I can't even like Twitter like befuddles me because I'm like, I don't, how does anyone fit it into 160 characters all the time? Like, I, I, I feel like I'm trying it, to write a haiku every time I open yeah, it. Yeah, it. It baffles me too. And yet <laughs> it's a definite talent because some people are very good at it. You know, there's no yeah. doubt about it. And they just have a 160 character mind. <laughs> you know, I have a 7,000 character mind. So I'm kind of out of luck. <laughs> Very good. Um, is there any um, re like reviews that you you wrote that you um, changed your mind on after the fact, maybe good or bad? Uh, well, my my your attitudes do change. Uh, I I always see I was a newspaper critic, which means I got one shot. Okay, and I wasn't. It it, it, it was different from. 
even a magazine critic who always had time to ruminate and to consider and to do all the sorts of things that one can do to trick oneself into believing one thing. But I saw the movie and I wrote the piece and that was it. And uh, I took my best swing at it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I've had that experience of coming across reviews. See, when I, I come, I, I'm not one for rereading myself. That's not one of my uh, weaknesses. I do, however, sometimes I'll see a movie on, uh, uh, you know, uh, F-Share or uh, Tubi or something like that. And I realize that I've, A, I have no memory of it. B, I'm still nevertheless pretty sure I am I reviewed it. So it's always very interesting for me to look up my review uh, that I've totally forgotten. I forget everything about it. I forgot my <laughs> attitude. I forgot any of the words I used and see something that I wrote, you know, 35 years ago, uh, a reviewing movie that, the older Steve Hunters just seen. And when I look at the pieces, I have to say there's considerable variation. Some of them I still think are quite good. Some of them, you know, I just say to myself, boy, <laughs> I missed the boat on that one. Did I ever? <laughs> and uh, I'm always more interested in them as, again, as I said this earlier, as pieces of writing. Do they work as pieces of writing, whether or not they are, uh, for better or, you, you know, whether or not I got the cr critical uh, consensus right or wrong. Uh, I, 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 when you see a, a movie a second time, it's almost like cheating because you do notice things. Sure. Uh, and the, well, for one thing, the, this, the element of surprise is gone uh, and you're able to sort of study this, the frame a little bit more carefully. You're able to uh, you're able to notice things. I, for example, saw the Wild Bucks the other night. I probably seen it, I don't know, fifty times in my life, maybe thirty five times in my life. And there's a line when the guy playing the Mexican general sort of drunkenly walks into a room, and from he's not even on stage and then the, the general has all his medals on and he's got his gold braid uh he's got his, his conductor's cap on and his tunic his gold tunic collar and <laughs> he walks into the into the you know the whorehouse i guess it is and in the background worn out says wow ain't he the one and i never noticed that line before <laughs> and there was something about it it was just so perfect. It just mm -hmm. cracked me up. And the, it was so beautifully timed. And there was just something about it that was so, you know, it just struck me as the very height of, of, of movie writing and movie acting and movie appropriate. It's just a simple line like that. And uh, I, it just, um, you know, I had missed it all the other times I'd seen that. Uh, uh, that movie, I hadn't noticed it or it hadn't uh, uh, connected or anything like that. So sure. um, that's the kind of thing uh, that, that I find delightful. That That's the sort of thing that, 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 that makes me happy. Right. Yeah. yeah, that makes perfect sense. Do you think with, um, so between kind of the storytelling from the storytelling point of view with it, right? They have different, um, Right in a movie, you're, everything's going in your eyeballs. You have comedic timing and things that you wouldn't have in a book, right? You may yes. you work yeah. on it a little, but it's not going to be exactly like an, an yeah. actor, you know, kind of saying it. Um, what would you say kind of the benefits, drawbacks between film and, and literature? Uh, um, well, I believe I have learned a great deal about editing from the film more than anything else. Uh, I also, the other thing I ever, you know, if, if I have a reputation, it's for writing uh, vivid action sequences. And that all, since I've never actually been in a real action sequence, <laughs> like this, but, uh, mm -hmm. I've got to create them in my mind. And there is no doubt that, uh, that the, that the, uh, that the, millions of image of frames of movie information that I've seen influence that. 
And also in, uh, it's, uh, you know, and I always take it when I about to start one of these, uh, one of these set pieces, I always remember something that Francis Ford Coppola said, and he said that the trick to doing them is to try to come up with a detail that no one else has come up with. And, and I really literally taken that to heart. And when I write these gunfights and other sequences, I'll always try and find a new date detail. It might be the muzzle flash. It might be the shape of the, of the smoke plume or the smoke cloud. It might be the sound. Uh, it might be, I might uh, emphasize the, the feeling of the gun, uh, of, of the parts moving in the gun to bring it to the point of firing, all of those things. And I always try and find some new thing uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to build the sequence around. And that's, that's an example of a very specific thing. The other thing is I, I get a lot of my effects from editing, from following multiple uh, plot strands and bringing one almost to climax and then cutting away to another one. And so the reader has to get through the second uh, uh, scenario before it gets back to the, you know, the, the fall of the hammer or the stroke of the knife in the first one. I do a lot of that. In fact, that's where I make my money. And I, uh, that's clearly influenced by, by the movies. Another one is there are, there's a, I, I don't even know if a word exists, but there's something that a movie could do that's very difficult to do. And it, I'm, what I'm talking about is kind of a general atmosphere to a scene or a sequence. And it, sometimes it's, it's quite miraculous and you can't really, it, there's no way to put it into words. One of the ones that I'm thinking right away is right after Don Corleone is shot and everybody at the Corleone house is struggling to, to get, uh, to make sense of it. There's a sense of panic and confusion and awkwardness. And Capola just evokes that brilliantly. And yet there's no way you can sort of, you can't, you know, other than saying everybody was panicked and everybody was, was <laughs> you know, there's just no way without the imagery that you can, that you can communicate that in prose, or maybe I better more accurately say, I haven't found it. Maybe someone else has found it, but I haven't found it. And so in all those respects, indeed, I have found my uh, movie Jones in my, uh, and my literature Jones uh, cooperate and each uh, assists the other. I thought that as the author of many, uh, you know, 20, 25 st stories of a sort, all which could have been made into movies, I understood something about storytelling. I brought something to my work in movie criticism about the technicalities of storytelling that maybe some other critics didn't quite have. And I understood why certain things had to happen at a certain time that baffled everybody else. And it was because you, you, one of the things you do in both books and movies is you kind of have to control the flow of information. And mm -hmm. The information is more important at point, you know, D than at point C, because because if you get it at point D, you already know what happens at point C. And the combination of the two of them is the effect that you're looking for. And it's it's just sort of stuff like that, that uh, it helped me as both a critic and a writer, I think. Sure. On the other hand, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I think that it did. And well, a, 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 end of, end of, end of comment. It's already seven minutes too long. <laughs> 
no worries that's the show everything just goes on seven minutes too long you know my wife's right. like what are you doing over there like i don't know we're i have no plan no I plan like you know that you yeah. knew this when you married me um so before we move on from uh criticism i have to ask this very selfishly i showed my son uh karate kid over the summer the original right. the original one i think 85 yeah. if i remember yeah. the year um yeah. 13 year old he absolutely loved it he was like oh dad can we watch more you know, old movies you know and uh because i think they're just better i, I think he actually I, i've noticed my kids picking up on the same thing you were saying it's not just a you know generational thing it's they're also going no these were better i, I enjoy this so what's the movie i have to show my son they would call it older i mean just you know or i guess actually any movie what's the one movie i need to show my uh 13 year old son yeah that's a really tough question and um I, I, nothing uh, pops to my mind uh, immediately. I, I, if I don't know him, I'm just trying to think of the best engineered movie of that time. And I, one of them, I would say, is uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, that's okay. a superb bit of, sure. of uh, uh, mid-level uh, commercial storytelling, pleasure-generating of it. And it's important to me because of the first review I did for the sun for a variety of reasons was right. that one. And it was, it was sort of that, uh, that breakthrough that enabled me, uh, you know, as I said, there's no sure way to get to, to get to these jobs, but that was one, that was a very good decision the night I decided to go see that at a preview screening. And so when someone said to me, have you seen it? I was able to say yes. Oh, good. Could you write a review of it? And I said, Oh, yeah. And you know, that's you know, uh that started the ball rolling, as it were. And so I have a fond place in my heart for that movie. But I think it's a terrific boys movie. Uh mm -hmm. I just uh I, I think your son, if he hasn't seen it, uh would would enjoy it. He's just about the right age. Right. Okay. Perfect. I will try that out. It's on my list, actually. All the Indiana Jones were on there, but we haven't got to yeah. them yet. So yeah. Well, that's the best of them in any event. Yeah. Sure. Well, and I when I say that, I don't even include the new ones. I don't even know what number we're on, but I yeah. <laughs> I've yeah. lost track. I'm like I can't. I can't keep track. There's three Indiana Jones. There's the rest. I don't know. That's that's for the people to decide. So as a as a film critic, what was it like to have one of your novels adapted to film? Uh, less disconcerting than you might think, and uh, also less interesting than you might think. I mean, I do get that question a lot, and I wish I, <laughs> I wish <laughs> I had, you know, a, a a bunch of vivid, wonderful stories to tell about sure. it, and I really don't. I, I. Uh, they were very good to me, I have to say. Mark Wahlberg was very good to me. Uh, I was invited to go to the set. They filmed part of it in uh, in in Washington, and I. They even there was a role where one of the actors had showed up, and they asked me to play it. So not only did I get to have my book. Uh, uh, I uh, made into a movie. I got to be in a movie and uh, it never made it. It was cut. Uh, the scene was cut. And I, it sort of, I, I must say it, it massively increased my respect for acting because try as I could, I couldn't bring the lines, couldn't get the lines to sound spontaneous. And I don't know how they do it, how they, how they can uh, how they can inflict spontaneity on their voices and make it sound like they're just thinking it up as they say it, when in fact you know they've known it since last night that they would say it. Sure. It's, it, it it just you know it, it I just I couldn't do it, and uh, uh, you know this is this is. Uh, it just was sort of an eye opener for me to understand. One of the things is, as a film critic, I was always a, I was an auteurist critic, meaning I was far more interested. I was too snooty to be interested in the acting. Uh, mm -hmm. I was far more 
interested in the director. Uh, the director was the author of the film and sure. uh, that sort of thing. And uh, and when I did that, I realized that I had underestimated acting and that it is a very, very refined skill. And you do not come to it easily. And uh, how, you know, how these people can do it, how they can memorize vast chunks of wordage and at the same time control face and body and presence and uh, rhythm and uh, position under very harsh lights with millions of dollars on the table or hundreds of thousands of dollars on the table and make it look as if they're not acting. That's uh -huh. to me, that's the great miracle of the motion picture actor. Uh, you know, I mean, a stage actor knows he's acting and you know he knows he's acting. And that's part of the fun of it. I mean, mm -hmm. there's the majesty and the dignity he brings to it. But the movie actor is in a different part of the universe. And almost always, except in specialized cases, his whole thing is about imitating spontaneity or being unspontaneously spontaneous. I don't know how they do that. I don't know how they do that. And it just is, uh, it, it really made me respect how good these people really are. It's just how, sure. how extraordinary they are. So. Right. Yeah, I believe it. You know, what's funny is I uh, I used to do stage acting, no, nothing major in any yeah. way. But um, so when I first started doing this show, I thought like, oh, it'll be pretty easy. I'm just talking with people. And this part is like fairly easy. I, I feel good. But the few times I needed to record something and it's just yeah. me and the camera. Yeah, I'm I'm just like a shy 13. I'm just like, I can't <laughs> like I can't spit the words out. I'm just like bumbling <laughs> over yeah. myself. Yeah. I don't know how like they do sweating. it without slurring the words. You know, I just, my whole diction <laughs> thing explodes like a hand grenade in my mouth when I'm trying to do it. <laughs> Very good. Was there anything you thought that the movie did maybe better than uh, than the book? Or did you see yeah. it and go, oh, I wish I had done that? No, no. No, no I actually... Uh, that, it seems like that's your roundabout way of saying, did I think the movie, was the movie any good? I think Anton is a very good director. Uh, I've said this before. They had trouble with my ending. Uh, they didn't think it had packed enough punch. They filmed it, but it didn't test well. So they poked on this sort of uh, assassination uh, at a hunting lodge I don't know, somewhere, I don't know where that hunting lodge was supposed to be. I don't even think the director was Antoine Fuqua, who is a very, very good director, by the way. And um, at that moment, I, I, I thought it, I, I thought the movie took a wrong turn. Uh, there were some things they did, they did very well. He is a very good action director. And all the action sequences were good. And I'll tell you one of the things about that movie that no other critic noticed, but one of the things that happens if you're around guns is there's a very specific way to handle guns realistically. Uh, and uh, it, most movies don't get that. And... In this movie, one of the reasons it's become sort of a cult favorite, and many people don't even realize this, it's because the gun handling is so good and so professional. And they took everybody in the cast, including Mark, who was going to handle guns, they took them to a firearms training facility for a week, and they were intensively trained on gun handling, how to carry a gun, how to, uh, you, you know, how not to cock it every five seconds, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. And um, even if you don't know that, even if you know nothing about gun handling, you will perceive that the gun handling in that movie is somehow 
of a level of authenticity that very few other movies are, are able to uh, are able to get. And I I thought that was a brilliant decision on their part, and people still respond to that uh, when they see it again if they know nothing about it. Uh, and and that that pleased me because one of my ideas in the books is to try to treat guns as tools and not demons, and uh, that I thought that was sort of the aesthetic of this movie, and I thought they did a good job at that. Um, I, and everybody in it was was you know uniformly professional. There was no weak sister performances. Uh, you know, it was basically, it was a, it was a very good, I thought, thriller movie, uh, yeah. you know, for the, for the, and it cost 70 million bucks. Why wouldn't it be good? So <laughs> sure. know, I didn't get any of that, but you know. <laughs> right. Well, it's funny because, um, I don't, know if Pete, I don't know if everyone watching knows this, but most of the guests on the show, including you, it's usually, it's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. So I had James Grady on. And then I'll, and then when James and I go, oh, hey, if anyone you know, if you don't mind introducing me, I'd love to get more people on. I mean, it actually helps with me, with my writing and my crazy family life to be able to keep the show going that I'm not pounding, you know, for guests all yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, and, so, and it's been awesome. I get great guests like you and things on. Uh, but when I when I asked Jim um, the same thing, he was uh, he was like, oh, no, I actually think that was my first book. I think they did this and this. And he, he went I didn't even ask him. He just went on about what, what they had done that ended up being better than um, what he had done. So it's interesting. Well, they that, cut off three days. The book they cut was, off three days. Yeah. The, the, the book was the six days of the condor. And, <laughs> uh, I always say to him, it's not funny anymore. Jim, what happened to Tuesday? Where did Tuesday go? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, you know, and well, I mean, one of the things they have to do is they have to, they have to shrink. They have to intensify. They have to make things more directly apparent. And uh, with some books that helps and with other books, it doesn't. See, I'm of the opinion that the feature movie is not the best uh uh, vehicle for the novel. Well, feature movie is very good for a short story, uh, mm -hmm. but the the twelve or sixteen part TV series is a much better uh, vessel for a novel because then you can get into the nuances and the subplots, and you can take some time to let the let the characters. What is there? Are there bees? There's buzzing? literally a fly just like <laughs> coming at my. <laughs> Well, that's a first for me. I've never seen that on uh, doing these things. <laughs> anyway, um, I can't for I, I can't remember what. I, oh, I was just saying that. And, and you see, when those are done, uh, 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 I, I would love to see a book of mine turned into a six or eight part TV series as opposed to another movie. I just think it would work sure. better. So right. Well, and then with all the, uh, the the swagger novels, right? I mean, you could do like seasons, right? They do a lot of like the HBO on these things, right? That's your season, uh, eight part yes, season. And, that's true. That's true. We yeah. Hope. yeah. Yeah. So, um, awesome. Um, so the last question about that um, was, and, and maybe this is out there and I just didn't find it, um, uh, point of impact. Was any of that... Um, uh, inspired by like the JFK assassination or? Uh, uh, well, it's relationship to the JFK assassination is very interesting. It was, the book was originally written uh, and the uh, JFK assassination was a subtext. And if you read it carefully enough, you realize that this unit that he was hunting was the same unit that had killed Jack Kennedy. And that was what I thought was one of the cool things about that draft of the book. However, halfway through the book, Alex, uh, what's his name? Alex Posner published a book on the JFK assassination. <laughs> and it pretty much convinced me that it was, it was, there was no conspiracy. And so I went through the book that I had written, which wasn't in public, hadn't yet been public. And I removed every single thing that, re that related to the Kennedy assassination. And I thought, oh, I am such a clever boy. Ho, ho, ho. 
and the book was published. And then when I guess I was rereading it or I just happened to find it, I realized I'd missed several of the allusions to the Kennedy assassination because I'm, I've confessed this a thousand times. I'm very sloppy. I wish I was had one of these, you know, <laughs> meticulous, organized minds. But, you know, for me, good enough is perfect. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I edited that book, Good Enough, but Not Perfect. And then another few years went by, and I started thinking about the Jack Kennedy assassination. And I came up with an angle that I thought no one had really looked at before. And one of, one of my angles, the, the angle was this. It's a very small angle. Is that there's no such thing as a big conspiracy. And every single Kennedy conspiracy, the only way they could make it work was make it bigger and bigger and bigger to cover all the possibilities. And I, in my in my uh, alcoholic brilliance one night, realized that if there were a conspiracy, it had to be very small. It had to be two or three people. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, Westinghouse plus the Girl Scouts plus Czechoslovakian intelligence. <laughs> it was X, Y, and Z. And they begin to put together a story of an assassination, of that assassination with just a few people. And there were some other things that my studies in the world of firearms ballistics had convinced me of that I won't go into now. And then one night I was thinking, I, as a joke, I said to a friend, we were drinking wine. I said to a friend, I said, you know, it'd be funny, it'd be funny to uh, turn Bob Lee Swagger loose on the Kennedy assassination. And he laughed and I laughed. And then I thought, Jesus Christ, that's the best idea I've ever had in my life. And I wrote a book called The Third Bullet, which mm -hmm. it, it's the small conspiracy interpretation of the Kennedy assassination. And I believe that it's just a lot of angles in it and a lot of questions in it that haven't been looked at carefully enough or have been taken uh, advantage of. Uh, and, and so uh, to answer your question, which you asked 19 minutes ago, did a, did that? So I have I've been round and round on the Kennedy assassination. And uh, it since this is you're letting me plug away, I would just say to people, some people think that the third bullet is the best book ever written on the Kennedy assassination fiction or not. What it does do is it comes up with, here is the, the stroke of genius, if I may. Um, instead of going against the Warren Commission, I went with the Warren Commission. And I said, let's accept everything the Warren Commission said and see if there's enough room in the shadows for there still to have been an assassination even or a conspiracy even if all those things were true maybe someone was still pulling the strings and that's what i came up with in the third bullet uh mm -hmm. again uh the book did very well it was a bestseller uh, uh you know and but uh, like all things of transitory nature in in pulp culture it just it just it vanished uh that's part of the game no sense okay. getting bitter about it but since i've got you since you brought it up drop it on you i would say to anybody with an abiding interest in this issue take a look at it you know you might mm -hmm. find it quite interesting it's only sure. 95 in paperback it'll only take you it's it's a long book uh, but writing it was a great adventure for me, and and hopefully you will enjoy it. It's also got yeah. some really cool gunfights. Oh, very cool! Well, you sold one. I, I did. You happen to hear? Uh, it was Rob Reiner that just did a podcast on the. It's called "Who Killed JFK," and they go into conspiracy. It's with another. Um, I wish I'll try to make sure I include it on the description. So if someone watches it, I give the the gentleman his credit. Um, he wrote a book about it and they go into 
the conspiracy and my wife and I were listening to it and it's like a eight part you know podcast yeah yeah um and uh it goes into it and by the end though we're our head was just like I'm like oh so who killed them we're like wait oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah um so I, I get what you mean with the blow it gets so big I'm like I don't know okay it gets too it, it can get so far out there it becomes abstract I wanted to move on to like the military here. I'm so I'm trying to read and talk at the same time. It's I'm not a paid actor. If there's a teleprompter, like I would never like this show would never exist, you know. Yeah. Um, so you you spent the time in the military, we we mentioned. Um, and uh and I'm sure that informed your life in, in, in many ways, but I'm wondering how um and I'm sure there's the the gun aspect to some degree, but I'm wondering how it informed you as a writer, as an artist. Yeah, you mean the uh, the military? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I think it does every young man good to be in a large, illiberal organization that doesn't give a damn what mood you're in. You know, you just, you know, I don't care if you don't feel like mopping the urinals today. Get in there (laughs) and mop the urinals. End of discussion. You know, and... And I, I always say I got more out of the army than the army got out of me. I had it pretty easy in the army. Um, it, it it was it was both interesting and infuriating. It was interesting to see how it worked. It was interesting to see how the different ranks related to each other. It was interesting to hear the language. Uh, it was interesting to, um, uh, th- there were just lots of very interesting things about it. Uh, I did not do one thing in the military that was uh, of much contribution to the military or the nation or the civilization. I just was, as usual, I went from <laughs> comfort to comfort to comfort. Uh, I'm, I've always have a talent for finding the most comfortable circumstances available and I'll be there in a split second. Ah, that's my one real gift. And <laughs> I was very comfortable in the army. And, uh, uh, I don't, I, I really, it's sort of for background for information that I could not have gotten any other way. Uh, that that was uh, that was very very useful for me, yeah. Because an army is both different and the same than c- the civilian world. Yes, it's different, but it's also the same. In fact, one of my key insights into the army was realizing that in many ways we think it's different, but it's the same. And you see the same office politics. You see the same people with connections getting ahead and you see the same uh, back roads to success. Uh, You see the same, uh, the input of influence and, uh, and uh, you see justice uh, completely uh, dealt uh, in, uh, in variable ways, depending on if it's a, you know, one of us or one of them, that's the object of the justice. It, it, you know, in other words, it, it was just like contemporary life in a technical society. Um, it's, and uh, uh, it, it was very good. It was very good background for me. A, B, I don't know what I would have done anyway for those two years. Uh uh, I can't, you know, I in no way can play to be a victim of the military. I was, if anything, it was my victim. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm glad I did it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I hated it when I uh, was in it. And then I missed it as soon as I was out of it. And I always, I always have a kind of a weird fondness for it. Although at the time... You could have knocked me over with a feather if you'd have told me that would that would was going to eventually happen. It wasn't so bad, okay. It sure. it was okay, all right. It was it was far from a searing or a shattering experience. Uh, 
it, there was a lot of cool moments. You got to do a lot of stuff you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Uh, I, I just, I hated the uniforms. And the other thing I hated was that I was in the old guard, as you say, and uh, the uh, protocol of the old guard at the time was the white sidewall because they wanted, when you had your ceremonials on and you had your cap down over your head, they wanted this to be uniformly white. So that is bald. So you couldn't have hair from here on down. Well, this was the late sixties, hair, hair, everywhere, hair. And I thought that was such an injustice. Oh, I was so indignant. That just seemed <laughs> to me to be so terribly wrong. And now I realize, you know, that was a small price to pay for as good as I had it. And uh, <laughs> the funny thing is, in many areas, the white sidewalls look, you see it on teenage boys all the time. So I guess they knew something that I didn't. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> they saw so the trend I, coming. Yeah, they did. <laughs> Who knew they were that's that that fashionable? <laughs> I know that's what people think. Like Virchachi Virch or however you say his name, I can't even say because I'm not fashionable. Oh. Uh, Virchachi, yeah. Virchachi, yeah, uh, or the got, military. Yeah, yeah. Who, who's yeah. to say who's more fashionable? You know, yeah, it's yeah. All, um, it's all out in the wash. Um, I wonder then, you know, so about guns, because you had mentioned, um, you know, how well they did in the movie, you know, just handling guns yeah. and how, how that's a thing. And actually, kind of, it's funny going back to my ill-gotten acting career. I was doing a play where I had to smoke a cigarette and uh, I was holding it like this. Uh, and they're like, no, it looks like you're smoking a joint. So I'm like, you know, yeah, you're yeah, smoking yeah. like a cigarette. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know, because I didn't realize like there's just a way people that smoke handle cigarettes, you know, yeah. people that handle joints. And maybe yeah. it was saying something revealing about me. You know, I don't yeah. know. But um, well, I do know and it was, yeah. but <laughs> um, getting into that. So like what it reminds me of. So my dad has, you know, has a bunch of guns. He likes to go shooting where we live. And uh, I live out, outside of Los Angeles, but they live in the far reaches of L.A. County, you know, yeah. a place called Palmdale. Um, yeah. And uh, it's like desert and stuff out there. And so we'd go shooting. And when my dad's shooting the gun, you could see like it connects with him kind of on like a like a core level. There's like a primal okay, yeah. level. Like he loves like it. shooting it. Um, and I go shoot it, you know, shoot it with him. It gets a little loud for me, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I've, I've never kind of connected the way he has. Um, yeah. um, and actually I went, me and my son were doing archery and I kind of felt how he did. I really loved like shooting the bow and maybe right. I just don't like noises. I don't know yeah. what, what the difference is, but um, from, from your background, it looks like maybe you have that same connection. So, you know, with, you know, with just guns in general and with firing them, do you, maybe? I don't know that I have a great question. I'm just wondering how you feel like about that connection. What, what it means uh, I have you. a very profound connection. Uh, it's ancient. Uh, it goes back to boyhood, even, you know, pre boyhood. Uh, there's nothing fake about it. Uh, it's, you know, I mean, as a, as a marketing tool to access a certain book buying demographic, it's been very useful, but, I wish I was smart enough to have figured that out. I just knew that <clears throat> guns simulate, stimulated, my, maybe they simulate too, my imagination in very profound ways. And <clears throat> uh, this is, you know, this is long, long established as part of the hunter uh, persona. And every story that I've written has had a gun in it. Uh, and the guns are always important to the story. And one of the things that made me so hungry to do this sort of thing was that I wanted to get the guns right. And I'd seen too many movies and read too many books where they were wrong. And one of the reasons that the one community that has embraced me is the shooting community is because I get most of the stuff right. I, I make mistakes. It's a very technical community and yeah. it's easy to make mistakes. And I have made more than my share, but fewer than anybody else. I like to say, uh, I'm, this is a line I'm cribbing from Joe Liebling. I like to say, I write better 
than anybody who knows more about guns. And I know more about guns than anybody who writes better. So mm -hmm. that, sure. you know, that, that makes me sort of unique. And uh, in the market, being having a unique quality is is always uh, it, it's helpful. You, you want to stand out from the crowd, and in that way, I sort of semi stand out from the crowd. Uh, I have no regrets about my gun. Uh, you could call it a fetish. You could call it an interest. You could call it an obsession. You could call it uh, uh, whatever you want to call it. You, you know, you make up your mind what it is. But it has been a major part of my life, and it's been something that I have enjoyed enormously and that has, I have found very provocative, and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. Whatever, you know, maybe it's cost me because I uh, you know, people dismiss me as a gun nut or they don't like me because I know the difference between a 308 and a 30 yacht six. That's okay. All right. I was like, I can do about that. I just have to be who and what I am. Cause that's all I'm selling. I have nothing else to sell. If I'm not that, then <laughs> I'm not publishable. I'm working, mm -hmm. you know, I'm retired from uh, the new chair English department is grumpy old Mr. Hunter. He he never <laughs> gave up on Hemingway and Fogger. So we had to get rid of him when he was 59 years, you know. So I I'm you know, I I that that's been very much a part of the life I've lived and the enjoyment I've taken in that life. Sure. Well, and I I don't know who said this, but there was someone that was saying that authentic, authenticity is the new currency. So, yeah, well, maybe so. Maybe yeah. so. If you can fake that, you're golden. Yeah, in my case, in that particular area, it's not faked. You know, that's yeah. sincere. Every show, and I, I, I'm, I'm thrusting this on you because I forgot to mention it early, but it's very simple. Um, I like to do a, a portion of rapid fire questions for the special edition of the show. I'm going to call them espresso shots. Um, so rapid fire, just your first thought on them. Um, you know, nothing controversial, so it'll, it'll be fun. Um, so you ready? Sure. All right. So you have one guy to take with you to a gunfight who you got Siskel or Ebert. Mm. Mm. Cisco, and the reason for that is gunfighting is and shooting is athletic. And Gene was tall and thin, and Roger was short and plump. And I think that Gene, just the odds are that he would be more athletic than Roger. That's all. I actually like Roger a lot more than Gene, but that's how <laughs> I would I would figure that one. Well, that, it's an important distinction though, because it's a gunfight. It can't. It's not about who you like. So yeah. You know, I, I hear you. I think we answered this one already, but it's on my list. So I'm I'm going to just of slavishly course. go off of course. what's in front of me. Of course, I understand that. <laughs> and completely acceptable. So are you a Ravens fan? And if so, what makes the Steelers so good? <laughs> Mike Tomlin makes them so good, and I am a Ravens fan. And... <laughs> I also think that, uh, well, you, you know, you 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 had a great quarterback for many years. You've had a number of great quarterbacks, and I'll tell you something funny. Here's a here's a here's a Sealer story. I happened to see the first game that Roethlisberger ever played in. It was in Baltimore. I can't that's remember right. who the starter was then. Was Tommy he, Maddox that, got hurt that game. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And he got hurt. And uh, I remember thinking, oh, boy, they're going to bring in some rookie. Oh, we're going to win. Well, he was great. And he almost won that game. And I thought to myself, boy, that guy's got a future. And I was sure <laughs> damn right, wasn't I? <laughs> you were right. You are right. One of the few <laughs> times in my life. <laughs> Very good. Writing rule that is utter garbage. Uh, well, I would say that uh, one set of writing rules that gets passed around was something that uh, what was a writing rules by Elmore Leonard on how to write a novel. 
maybe you've seen them, people who pay attention to this sort of thing have certainly seen them, and they're utter garbage unless you want to write an Elmore Leonard novel. I mean, what he was telling you wasn't how you should write a novel, but what he, uh, how he wrote a novel. Well, I don't want to write Elmore ne Leonard novels. I want to write right. Steve Leonard novels. So what would be the point of writing, you know, a, that was just a sort of a waste of paper as far as I was concerned. And of course, we don't, no one criticizes Elmore Leonard Except I guess I just did, but I just I just thought that whole thing was kind of stupid. <laughs> so bigger achievement: winning the Pulitzer Prize or appearing on Writers on Zoom drinking coffee? Oh gosh, I hope if I sell some some um, more copies of the Third Bullet that because of this that I'll be able to say this was the Pulitzer Prize was fun. Uh, but as far as impact on my life, I, I, you know, it'd be difficult to uh, categorize it or to explore it in any uh, empirical way. But it's, I, I don't know, it was ephemeral. I mean, it was a great moment when they told me, uh, they say I disproved the uh, uh, bromide that white men can't jump because I jumped through the roof. I was so excited. <laughs> it had been a ridiculous obsession and, and dream. And I don't, uh, I I'd totally given up on it. I'd been a finalist a few other times, but then I had sort of was no longer, I was no longer, uh, I don't know, interesting to them. And then uh, it, so it just came from nowhere. And it was, a is a great moment. Has it had much effect on my life? <laughs> I really can't. I, I really, I don't know. You know, right. it's not yeah. like, you know, it's, it's maybe it's, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm babbling here because I don't have a policy on it. Sure. No, I mean, but you're right. It's probably the show. I mean, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would agree. I mean, I, yeah. not that I'm the one who won it, but have you ever witnessed anything inexplicable? I've had one ESP experience involving my work. I was getting on an airplane and I felt the presence of one of my books. I just felt it. And there was someone ahead of me and he had a paperback and I knew that was my book. And uh, I did all sorts of gymnastics and penetrations in order to get up close enough to him to get a view of his of the cover of the book and it wasn't my book and i was crushed and i sat down in my chair and two people later a guy walked by carrying my book and uh so oh, wow. in, that, in that's the only sort of i don't know if that was coincidence or if sure. it was i was sensitive I'm so narcissistic that <laughs> I'm <laughs> my own aura or something. I don't know. But that's that's as close as I've come. Right, right. That's funny. I was uh, telling the story at a dinner date the other night, but I had one case of ESP when I was in fifth grade. Uh -huh. um, my first crush was on Paula Abdul, um, uh -huh. the old singer. I mean, not even, I think she still sings and, and dances yeah. and things now, but there was a girl in my class who I thought looked just like Paul Abdul. Like uh -huh. I'm fairly certain now as an adult, she didn't, but I was, I yeah. was certain. So I had sure. a crush on this girl and I had a dream the night before that we were going to completely rearrange the class. And my teacher would do this. They'd be rows and then we'd be boxes or whatever. We were going to change it into this very specific shape. And she was going to be sitting right next to me. And the next day, the very first thing we did is they moved the desk. They put him in the exact shape. She was next to me. I even remember where my friends were. Like, it was so okay. I remember it happening and going, wait, because I woke up thinking about it. I'm like, oh man, am I going to sit by Rachel today? This is going to be awesome. You know, I think of my voice at fifth grade is more like, I'm going to sit by Rachel. Oh, it was like Mickey Mouse or something <laughs> going on. But so I know how you feel. And then I'm like, is it just that I was trying to like manifest that or like, you yeah. know, who, who's to say? Does Mark Wahlberg still get angry when you refer to him as Marky Mark? Uh, I, he, uh, we weren't that close uh I mean, <laughs> we didn't exchange numbers or phone calls or, or nicknames or anything like that 
I did meet him, you know, I, when I, when they introduced him, we, we sort of talked that two or three times. And he said at one point to me, he said very earnestly, Mr. Hunter, I hope we get to make all your books into movies. And he actually stuck with it. And it, I don't know, that book was later turned into a TV series that lasted for three years. And he was one of the producers and I suspect one of the moving, uh, 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 you know, one of the reasons why, why that project happened, which was more money and more, a little bit more uh, traction and attention. And uh, so I, I will only say, and I, the other thing is that, project only happened because Mark found the script and he went and he and Antoine wanted to make a movie and they had been looking for scripts and the script had been written a few years earlier and he found the script and he was the one who took it for Antoine and that's what got made it happen so I'll be eternally grateful for Mark I'll never say anything bad about Mark uh, uh, he was just a he's very good to me and sure. uh, I can't, I, I can't fault him for that. Oh, sure. He seems like a good guy. So he was, when he started, he was a, um, a singer. There was Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch. No, I, I realized oh, okay. that. And uh, <laughs> I, 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 remember, sure. I wasn't just throwing a nickname at him. I just, yeah. I yeah. don't know if he was ever upset. I think I just heard that somewhere and thought it would be fun to ask. So maybe we can transition to the newest book. Um, so Front Sight, it's three uh, swagger novellas. Um, and actually, that's my first question, because when when I was going through um, your uh, uh, your list of works, this seems like the first novellas. Is there is it because I know it's the generations Did you do novellas just so you could get the, all three generations into the book? Or was there is there a reason going novellas versus novels? Yes. Uh, the reason was publishing exigencies. Uh, I had uh, just I'll try and tell us quickly. Uh, it's not that interesting. So the sooner I'm through it, the better off for everybody. As, you know, as a movie person, as well as a writer person, I do get, I go on uh, movie sprees, like musicals. I have to see every 40s musical made, or Fred Astaire. I've got to see every Fred Astaire ever made, or Samurai. I've got to see every, well, I went on one such for film noir, I always love film noir, but I said really get into it. And I just really, really enjoy the old film noirs, uh, particularly from the 40s and the early to mid 50s. And so one summer, I had a kind of a soft summer coming up. So I decided I'm going to write the perfect film noir script. And I did. The only problem was no one else thought it was perfect. I don't know what was wrong with them, but they didn't. So I had the script that nobody would touch. My friends thought it was good, but I, you know, there's all these secret rules of screenwriting and I know nothing about it. I, uh, I am sure I violated all of them. So I had this script and the years passed and I always sort of regretted not bringing that off. And I was looking for a book and uh, I, just, I, written a book that was very hard and demanded a lot of research. It might've even been the, uh, no, no, I, I can't even remember what it is, what it was, but I, I wanted an easy book. I won't, I won't, no, I didn't want an easy book. I wanted easy money. Uh, believe me, mm -hmm. of the kinds of money, easy money is the best money. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to change the script to a novel. It'll take two, what? <laughs> What could go wrong? It'll take two weeks and I'll get all that wonderful green, luscious money. Ha, 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 ha. Well, it was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. It was miserable. It was awful. And I, I quit three times. I was so depressed. I almost, you know, ate the gun several times. It was just awful. And so finally I got it and I went through all of that. And it turned out to be... Through all that work and all that anguish and sweat, it turned out only to be 130 pages long. Uh, and I thought to myself, no one, you know, that's exactly the wrong length. It's too long for a short story and it's too short for a novel. And I thought the only way I could bring this off is to write two other novellas. 
And once I had decided that, having written the first one, which starred, if you will, Earl Swagger, I thought, okay, well, I'll do the other Swagger boys. So I had a big chunk of uh, something from another novel that I cut out and never published that I thought was pretty good. It was set in the Chicago stockyards uh, in 1934. And so I thought, I'll go back and I'll turn that into a novel. And that became, I do a novella. And so I did that, and I uh, that became the first novel in the book, my first novella in the book. Uh, and then I knew I had to do a Bob Lee swagger, and um, I had no idea. I mean, I totally had no idea. But uh, since the other two had been, it could be argued, well, one was a film noir, and the other one wasn't anything. It was just a novella. But I had been through another movie spree in the meantime, and this movie spree was for a genre called giallo, which is yellow in Italian, and it's for a certain very bloody, indefensible horror mystery movies of the of the 1970s. And I thought, you know what? It'd be fun to put Bob Lee Swagger in a giallo. So I sat down with no plot with no outline, nothing but that vague conceit. And I started typing. <laughs> Three months later, I was good. And I thought, this is the best damn thing I've ever written in my life. No, that's not quite true. But, I, I, you know, it actually, it turned out, I think, very well. I was surprised how, how several plot decisions, I consider myself a lousy plotter, but they really worked out perfectly. Had I planned them, they couldn't have worked out perfectly. So that became the third. And at that point, I realized that two of the three were movie-oriented, one being film war, the other being giallo. So should the first one be movie-oriented. The only problem was it wasn't. <laughs> I had no thoughts of movies when I did it. So <laughs> artificially and non uh non-spontaneously, I tried to find a genre to fit it in because it was largely set in a, in a, in a, uh, uh, stockyards. I thought maybe I could get away with calling it a Western and it did have several Western components, but it just wasn't quite a fit. And there was a kind of movie then is now called, uh, well, it was, then it was called social realism. Now it's and ultimately became a message picture, a crusading picture, against social ills. And so that's what I decided to call it. Uh, and it's sort of that. I mean, it's not a perfect fit, but it, you know, <laughs> no, nothing else would have been better. So then in order to make it clearer to the reader and to sort of frame each story, I started each story with an author's note explaining what film genre the story uh, was a prose variation on. And uh, that's gotten a lot of attention. People seem to like that. It was a completely sort of uh, uh, unconsidered decision, and it seems to have paid off rather well. Uh, and uh, the book, uh, needless to say, uh, is doing quite well and getting excellent reviews. So all in all, uh, even though I was close to suicide at one point, I, I can't believe it's done. And I can't believe I got Johnny, finally got Johnny Tuesday, which is the middle one, got that uh -huh. into print. And um, uh, um, so that's the story of that book. That's the fastest I've ever told that story. So consider yourself <laughs> recipient of a rare gift. Usually it takes about an hour and a half. Very good. I mean, you really edited I, that down over the yeah, time. It's here. like an actor. I've I've learned my part. <laughs> right, exactly. And you sounded spontaneous and everything. Yeah, you're, I know. <laughs> you're going to be starring in one of these. You're going to have a part in them at least. Yeah. Um. So I, I guess with that being the background, maybe this doesn't apply. But um, I wanted to ask anyway. So there's the lineage of the characters. Um. So besides the the obvious part of like kind of keeping, you know, right, the characters you've written with a lot of, a lot of in the past. Um, is there any connection between them? Bes like, besides the fact that the characters are literally um, 
you know, related to well, each other. Well, yes, but that's one of the little tricks of the book. You will see that there are a similar, there are several pieces of equipment that make their uh, appearance in each of the stories. And each of the men doesn't realize that, but every reader will. And, uh, you know, I, I just look upon that as a kind of an amusing extra literary pleasure. You know, mm -hmm, sure. you know, Bob has no idea where the shotgun he's carrying came from, but we've seen it, you know, used right. in the past. We know exactly where it came from. We were there when it was bought. We were no, we know why it was bought. So that, you know, that, there, there's that. The other thing is the play of genetics is something I seem to be uh, intrigued with, and I try and make the men similar enough so that we we see them as a father, son, and grandson, and yet each is singular and you know in in some way that is different than before. And yet I hope it all hangs together. And that that was one of the one of the pleasures of, of of doing the book or the way I did it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. It, it is interesting when you see too, because then I think uh, it used to be there's, I guess they still debate it, that whole nurture versus nature. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then that when you, when you have kids or you're just around young people and nothing, you start to realizing like, man, there's so much is nature. I don't think it's either, or I think that it's just a complicated interplay, maybe per person, depending on um, different factors. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. And there's different um, amounts of talent and intelligence and uh, and uh, creativity and work ethic. And those, you know, those seem inalienable. I mean, they just seem there and you don't recall. Yes, it is. It's fascinating, but ultimately unknowable is, I guess. Right. Sure. My point. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and then um, is there any, so... Okay, now I can read my my writing. <laughs> is there anything about that that lineage in the um, in the novel? Where was that? Any of that related to you? Was any of that like thinking about your own lineage, your own? Well, that's an interesting question. And I happened to come from a doomed alcoholic Southern agrarian family. That's Southern Mid South, uh, Missouri, and. It was something my father hated, and that was the reason he left Missouri and ended up an academic in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, and he he pretended to despise all the family connections and the family heritage and all that stuff. And uh, it was never it, that's how it was presented to us. And I don't uh, though we did go back and visited his brother and his mother living on a very nice farm in south of Sykeston, Missouri, and um, south of Cape Girardeau, Missouri, between Cape Girardeau. And, and those memories are very vivid in my mind. And I, I, I am aware that the Swagger family has, well, the Swagger family probably wouldn't exist without the Hunter family having existed before, though there's nothing precisely, uh, there's, not, there's, no, no, there's no anecdotes or anything that's precise so much as a milieu of, of the awareness that a young man has of family ghosts and demons and, and of, a, of a complicated somewhat dark past and uh uh you know that's that's that, that, that's for some reason that was very attractive to me and i, I will say this here's something uh i've only said seven thousand times before this whole swagger family uh episode and it starts we first encounter it in 1780 in one of the books and when we learn where the word swagger came from the name swagger came from when I started Point of Impact in 19, the 1980s, I had no idea I was going to do this. I had no idea I was going to write uh, 14 or 15 more books 
all with a swagger of some sort or another, that they were all going to be connected and that they were going to overlap and uh, reflect and use, you know, what had been published, you know, and then it was going to be a, a saga, if you will, a family saga. Sure. Uh, no idea I was going to do that. And, uh, and doing that has been one of the great surprises and privileges and pleasures of my life. I mean, I'm just just stunned at how much fun I've had doing that and how how meaningful it's come to me. And I, you know, when I, I'm I'm sort of a slut when it comes to publishers. So I jump for the money from house to house to house. <laughs> and and yes, you know, sometimes an editor of this house will say, well, why can't he do such and such? Uh, or I say, why can't you, why can't he be killed? And I have to say to him or her, well, the reason is that eight books ago, he appears only that set later in time. So that if I kill him, the whole, you know, and this means yeah. nothing to them. It means mm -hmm. nothing to them, but it's very, you know, it's my creation. It's my little sure. thing. And it's, uh, it's kind of important to me to mm -hmm. uh, preserve as much as that as I can. So, oh, absolutely. And it's important to your fans too, right? The second oh, you do seem, that. I, they seem to like it a lot. I get a lot of, oh, more stuff about the swaggers. Oh, so that, you know, and that's fun. That's always very grateful, uh, very uh, uh, pleasing. Right. Awesome. Um, and so I think that's my, my questions on it. Um, were you, um, do you have some you could read for us today or is it from that book or uh, any other book I suppose that you would like? Yeah. Okay. I will do this. I don't do this. Well, you'll see why I was never an actor. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, this is, uh, I'm evoking the cat, the, uh, Chicago stockyards and the behavior uh, of of the uh, of the of the cattle, okay. This is from Chapter Two of City of Meat. Are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. We have some music. No, no, I'm easy. <laughs> How do they know? Hard to say. Maybe it's the molecules of blood in the air and inhaled. Those molecules tickle some ancient cell cluster, and the not terribly sophisticated bovine cerebellum. Maybe it's pure instinct acquired over thousands and thousands of years of obediently awaiting their execution, passed somehow from generation to generation. Maybe they're reading the behavior of the men who heard them, seeing that it's oddly different this time, not meant to soothe their fears as happened so frequently on the range, instead meant to hurry them, uh, push them in a certain direction and into a certain cattle trace and up a certain narrow ramp. And somehow the human sweat and fear at the presence of so much death is something they themselves have learned to sense. So that's that's the cows being headed to the kill house at uh, a uh, cut rate butcher uh, uh, meatpacking outfit in Chicago in the year 1934. Mm, very good. Thank you for that. And that's one that was which novella? That's was that from uh, them or? City of Meat. So I, I, I have to tell you something very funny here. The name of the story was originally The Night Train because there's a drug in it and they call it The Night Train because it takes you on a nighttime journey. Sure. Uh, but I decided I didn't like that because that wasn't really central to the story. And the stockyards were central to the story. So I changed the title to uh, to City of Meat. However, somehow publicity never got to work. So all the, it, not on the jacket copy, but in all the promotional copy, that story is called by the wrong name. <laughs> So, uh, you know, people say to me, oh, I can't wait to read the night trade. And I think to myself, <laughs> oh, yes, you can. 
because there ain't no night train. So it was, night uh, train, you know, it, just, it was a, you know, if you've ever worked for a newspaper or any publication, there's always the issue of the correction catching up with, with the mistake. And Usually you make it, but sometimes it's like it's like an old time movie where the guy is running after the caboose and he doesn't quite make it. In this case, he didn't quite make it. That caboose is on the night train as it's going yeah. down. To stay yeah. is the title. Usually with the shows, I like to say it's you know it's last call. You don't have to leave, but you'll have to restart the video. Um, and I usually like to ask at the end, like, what's a small piece of advice, you know, someone can take to make their life a little better. Um, I did, though, see um, a quote of yours. And if this isn't a quote of yours, because sometimes the interweb isn't the most accurate, then we'll go back to the original question. But um, I think it was about uh, people approaching retirement or retirement. And uh, you had, as you had said, avoid the bitter. Yeah. Um, and I think the I think you had given examples of like Hemingway and um, John Wayne. Um, people famously kind of became better um, yes. later on in life. Um, yes. So I'm wondering, um, I guess, two things. One, how have you done with avoiding the bitter? And then two is maybe you could expand on that a little more eloquently than what you meant by that. than um, by flumsy paraphrasing. Let's see. Yeah, I I mean, nothing is com- nothing is 100%. Generally, I have avoided the bitter. Uh, and generally, I live a very happy life. Yes, I can, under certain circumstances, get bitter about certain professional disappointments. You never get everything you want. I've gotten so much of what I wanted that it would be it would be entirely inappropriate for me to complain about the few things that I haven't gotten. Nevertheless, I didn't get them. And I'm not going to complain about them. I'm not going to reveal them. But I am going to say that when people say to you, you know, it's, it's, it's baffling to me that many people consider me a huge success. I don't feel like a huge success. I just feel like another guy who did the best he could. And sometimes it was okay. And sometimes it was not okay. But they say to me, how can you be so sad? You got everything you want. But here's the thing. I didn't get everything I wanted. I got everything you wanted. Okay. But that's meaningless to me. I don't care what you wanted. I only <laughs> care what I wanted. And I didn't get X, Y, and Z. So damn it, I'm teed off. So mm-hmm. that's 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 the reality behind the sure. not be allowing yourself to be bitter. Is that uh fair enough? That's that's fair enough. Yeah. It's funny we were um I have gout. So I or as I like to say the gout. Um, and so we had we had taken our kids one day to Disneyland and uh, I have a flare up like, like a few days before. So I'm at, I'm limping around. Yeah. Not as painful as it gets at times, but it's painful to walk and I'm limping around the most magical land on earth. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, my wife and my son are kind of teasing me. And they're like, oh, you know, look, look, you're, you, everything you do is painful. And I was like, well, look, I have a, I have a great wife, a beautiful wife. I have my son is like my my best buddy, but God doesn't give with two hands, you know. So I have to, every step I take, I have to be in pain. Like this is just how it goes, you know. So um, I guess it is always that like, that way you look at yeah. it, right? You don't get everything you want, and like yeah. You know, so at times I'll be like laid up in bed and I'll be bitter about it, and right. a lot of times I'm like, what what can you do? So yeah, um, yeah. So that's lovely. So. Um, Thank you so much for uh, for coming on, you know, taking the time. Thank you, Bill. Uh, you were you were great. I enjoyed this enormously. Oh, great, great! I'm, I'm so glad. I hope I actually want it to be fun for everyone. I, I always say it's a labor of fun. So when yes, it stops right, being yeah. fun, I but you've got a wonderfully fun. engaging personality, so uh, that helps. Uh, and you yeah. you hew to no agenda, and you and you go with however uh, quirky quirky direction we managed to tumble into so it was good fun for me thanks for tuning in if you have a subject you'd like us to cover or something you'd like us to do a deeper dive into drop us a comment we'd love to include it on a future episode 
It shows labor of fun and it's truly a reward in its own right. But if you do, would like to support me or the other amazing authors I have on there, consider picking up a book. Any of the writers we have on here would be a great, great addition to your bookshelf. Each one is a master storyteller and just a great person to boot. So you'd be doing them and yourself a great favor and and picking those up. And while I would never call myself a master because that would be, as we said in the 90s, conceited, I do have on a pretty good authority from critics that my mom alike, so I'm not bad. So if you wouldn't mind picking up one of my books, that would be great as well. I would appreciate it. Thanks again for watching. And thanks to my great panel of guests for coming on and, and spending this time with us. Cheers.